Hello, I am Manuel Trachtenberg, the Executive Director of the INSS, and with me is Prina Sharbit Baruch, uh, the Head of the Law and National Security Program at the INSS. How are you doing, uh, Prina? So, so. Uh, so, so. <laughs> yes, indeed. I can't say reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> so, we want to uh, talk uh, briefly uh, about uh, the passing of the law uh, yesterday uh, on reasonableness. It's even hard to spell it out. That's why they decided to strike it out. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, that essentially marked the climax of a process that started uh, seven months ago when the government, uh, the coalition, put forward a package of uh, judicial reform and uh, it ignited uh, enormous uh, protest that uh, has continued uninterrupted for 29 weeks in a row involving uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, in the end, this is the one law that was finally passed by the Knesset. Uh, can you first, uh, Prina, describe what this law is all about that created such an uproar? So the law itself uh, uh, touches upon the judicial review over decisions by the government, the prime minister or a minister, and declares that they will not be able, that the court will not be able to examine the reasonableness of their decisions. It will still be able to interfere or intervene under other heads of interference, like if there are, a, a, if they examine the, the wrong a, a considerations or a discrimination, a, but not under the reasonableness, which is the main today, uh, the main ground of a, carrying out such a review. So is this uh, the, the end of democracy, as many claim? So um, this is just as, uh, uh, as if it stands on, uh, on its own as one uh, uh, change. This is not the end of democracy. It is a problematic uh, uh, amendment to the law because, uh, in essence, it gives the, the government uh, a kind of green light to make a lot of decisions that, are, that they are also planning to make that are problematic, that don't take into consideration, uh, uh, that don't do the right balance. Uh, it, is, it opens up uh, uh, the path for corruption, for appointing uh, political appointments, uh, and uh, and for not considering uh, all the implications for the best, better interest of the public when making decisions. So it is a problematic uh, amendment. However, it doesn't end the democracy. The problem is that it is perceived as a first step. It's, it is perceived as a first step because many those in the government that have been pushing for this amendment and others have said that this is right. a first step. Um, and there are other steps on the way that are all meant eventually to weaken the, the, the possibility of the judicial, uh, of the judges, of the courts to uh, carry out any kind really of control, uh, of supervision over the government's actions. So one of the characteristics of uh, this uh, protest, uh, this massive protest, is that uh, uh, many of the leading figures in the protest uh, are, to this day, uh, members of the armed forces, uh, not active, but reservists, uh, those that volunteer to continue service, uh, like the pilots, the fighter plane pilots, and the special forces, uh, and so on. Many of them, actually, uh, the other day, they mentioned the figure of 10,000 of these reservists. They said that if the legislation is advanced, they will suspend their volunteering to uh, serve in the army. How, th how serious is this threat to the what's called in Israel Tzva Am, the army of the people, which is kind of a fundamental principle by which the IDF uh, was created, and to this day, uh, that's what we feel it is for us, um, how serious it is. 
It is very serious because the, our military, yes, is based upon volunteers that volunteer for the, reserves to, uh, uh, for the reserve duty, but also the soldiers that remain uh, after they finish their initial uh, uh, prescription are uh, also volunteering. I mean, they get paid, but they don't have to remain. And they, there are volunteers for the special units. So there's a lot of volunteering going uh, as part of the military service. And, uh, and also the military service, everybody is supposed to serve. So many of those that are uh, going to protests uh, are uh, youngsters, some of them in high school that are supposed to enlist, some of them are even in the military, uh, some are reservists, and uh, this is impacting, uh, I think, on their sense of trust in the government, that the government indeed is sending them to the, to the military to carry out the tasks that endanger their lives, Uh, also, um, and to trust that the government is doing it for the benefit of the state, of the benefit of the good of the whole public, because I think what we see today is a, a, a crisis, a very deep crisis of trust in the government and in, 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 in intentions. Uh, so again, it's not the unreasonableness, it's really the, fa- the, the, the feeling that this government is not committed to democratic values, is not committed to To liberal values is not committed to uh, uh, upholding human rights uh, to the rule of law and then people say if that is the case if this is the government we don't want to go and fight for this government and this is a, a big threat because we need our military we have enemies we are not a, it's not just a military just a, for a, having a military so uh, so it, it is it is a potential uh, threat to the security national security and Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I would like to add to that. I mean, there's no question that the qualitative, qualitative age that the uh, Tsahal, you know, the army has, the unbelievable uh, capabilities that we have, both in the Air Force, the intelligence, the cyber, uh, the special forces and so forth, is due to the fact that the, the people, that the youngsters that serve in them, feel a very strong commitment to the idea of defending this country and the way and this the state of Israel which we know it's supposed to be a Jewish and democratic state and what they claim is that is this covenant between the the state and those that serve the state the, the army through the army is this that covenant is threatened and then the motivation to keep serving with the same intensity with the same selflessness I mean which is really amazing uh, that uh, element will weaken and therefore the quality of the army and those uh, volunteering uh, will weaken and this is a very a very serious threat to national security we at the INSS we deal primarily with national security and And therefore, that's uh, what we put the emphasis on. Isn't that so? Yes, and I, I think, and there have been uh, already, the INSS has published alerts uh, on, on, on the impact of what's happening uh, to national security, to the military, to the economy, which you can, uh, is, uh, of course, explain. Uh, um, uh, the, the state is, is under turmoil and it's becoming weaker. It's becoming poorer. It's becoming less stable. Uh, the coherence, uh, the civ- so, so coherence within society is breaking up. Uh, we've had a lot of rifts in the past. The society is not uh, the homogeneous. There are different ideas, but we managed somehow to live together, to put together the democratic and Jewish, the national and the religious and the liberal and the democratic ideas. Somehow it worked. And now the, the fear is that it's not going to work anymore, that the split is something that it will, very, it will be very difficult to put things back together again. Right. Um, you know, the, in a few months, we are going to commemorate 50 years to the Yom Kippur War, which to this day is the, by far the, the biggest uh, trauma that the uh, Israeli society uh, had, had experienced and uh, is always mentioned as something that should be avoided at all costs. You know, that sort of trauma, not necessarily what happened with the war. And... Uh, Prominent people in Israel, uh, both, both former senior officers in the army and others, are calling this uh, crisis kind of, a, kind of an echo 
of a Yom Kippur war kind of magnitude in terms of the crisis that it's uh, generating. Um, and you mentioned uh, Pnina as uh, many of the reasons for that. One another aspect is the um, the way it affects social resilience. Can you elaborate on that? So social, social resilience is uh, also based on social cohesion, on trust within the society, on feeling bond to each other. And all these things are being threatened. The, the, what we see today is the split that is, is, is splitting up families, uh, friends. People are not talking to each other if they think differently. There's a, a demonization by both sides, by the way, of the other. Right. And, um, and when, the, when we are so split... Um, when people are actually hating each other, I think when, when, when this is the feeling, uh, this makes us much weaker because now there's all this internal um, uncertainty, division, and if now we also have face uh, external threats, which we are, they are always there, but if suddenly it materializes more, uh, some say it might unite us again, but on the other hand, it will make it more difficult, uh, I think, to find uh, this resilience that we need to face uh, and encounter such threats. So I think it is, um, and also the, what's happening in the military is also weakening uh, the way we are perceived by our enemies, and uh, uh, so it can also impact um, the deterrence. Det- deterrence, exactly. And so, so uh, there is a connection between what's happening within inside and the way we we can uh, we can meet our uh, threats from outside and um, and I think what's very sad is that you hear many Israelis that are feeling that they that they are that they can't see a future in the country that the, the fear is that the country is going towards uh, uh, becoming more religious more nationalistic less liberal and then they might need to leave and when well, the ones that are thinking about leaving the country are the are the, are the elites are the ones that the startups say uh, are based on the economy is based on the med the doctors uh, the, the engineers um, and this is a, a, a huge threat for the state of Israel if all these or even some of these leave the country and Um, so so really uh, this is a crisis that I um, I don't remember having seen and people that are older than me also don't remember that having seen because the enemy is from within from inside us and we don't know we don't have a mechanism when the enemy attacks us from outside we trust the IDF <laughs> we trust the the security establishment but here there's no one that can help us solve this say uh, this enemy from within of this breakup of society right uh, the other side of the coin though I mean the silver lining is is that this this tremendous awakening of uh, civil society um, and I want to repeat that I mean the fact that we had we have every uh, every week uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets uh, in all over the country not that not just in the Tel Aviv which is kind of the, the natural candidate for that uh, persistent in Uh, hopeful you know waving the the flags of Israel um, that's very encouraging to me because it's the what well, you said that you know there is this fear of people leaving the people are demonstrating are not going to leave I mean it's it's essentially I'm um, by the way by now most of them are young uh, at the beginning uh, the, the the first demonstrations most of the people were my age not a good <laughs> symptom uh, but by now, I mean, there are mostly young people. Um, who would Im- have imagined that the youngsters that work in high tech, which we can see that you know hedonistic and they, they are driven by personal ambition and they, they only want to exit and go to the US and whatever, that they will be so committed because it's committed is a commitment to the country, to their own society. They are not going to let down. Israeli society so for me that's very encouraging uh, not just for me I mean for anybody that looks at it and and also some of the those pushing forward for the reform for the judicial reform some of them are driven by what they perceive as a true move towards more democracy even if we don't agree with that and So we have to recognize that I mean it's not just driven yeah. by personal interest or, or something of that sort it's also important to notice that all these demonstrations hundreds of thousands of people and there's been 
no casualties, very, uh, no fatalities, very few fa- casualties and uh, usually minor injuries. The police has, have been restrained. Yes. I, I mean, the police are really having a very difficult time and they're using restrained force. You don't also see, you see really marginal clashes between uh, people from the other that think differently that are for this government. Right. Um, and there was one f- a big fear that it would go to violence, and it's not. And I think another thing that maybe is the... Uh, I think at the moment we are hearing the, v- the, the extreme voices are the ones that are being heard. Right. And most of the people... want a democracy well most of the people understand that compromises have to be that you can't get everything they want and they want to live together even with people that they don't think the same uh, have the same ideas um, th- the challenge is how do you reach this majority of the people um, and make them talk to each other um, and not go all the time to the extreme voices and think that everybody that thinks differently belongs to the extreme voices because that's not tr- the case and I think this is a challenge today of all democracies around the world that the extreme voices are the ones that uh, uh, gain more power than the ones in the middle that really want to live side by side even if with, with disagreement but still uh, in uh, some kind of harmony absolutely actually what's uh, reassuring is that consistently all the public opinion polls that For the last half a year show that the solid vast majority of the people want compromise they don't want to humiliate the other side uh, they they are for what we call in Hebrew Idavrut, which is uh, essentially to have a conversation so as to try to reach mm-hmm. white agreement and consensus of the on these issues most of the people understand that the changes in When you change the rules of the game of the democratic game you cannot do it unilaterally okay so that broad agreement exists so the big challenge challenge for Israel is how to translate that popular will that solid majority into political action that will reflect that accurately that's the challenge we don't have that mechanism at present but I'm sure that the You know, if we invented uh, an Israel ways which give us the direction, perhaps we will have the ways in the political system to uh, direct us to a better future in Israel. I believe in that. Prina, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, do this podcast with you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.